Okay, so welcome to the Minnesota Art Exhibit question and answer session with the artists. Uh, we are so grateful that many of our artists have been able to join us today on Zoom. We thank you for your time and we really thank you for sharing your work with us in this fantastic show um, during kind of a difficult time. COVID was a difficult time and this show has brought a lot of folks a lot of light. <laughs> and so we're really eager to have some time to speak with each of you. Each artist will probably have about five minutes or so. Um, that way we kind of divide the time evenly and get through everyone. We'll probably try to focus on one of your paintings or one or two if we can. Um, and again, we, just, we thank you all for coming and this has just been an exciting show. I hope you can hear well enough. We will start with Laura Cruzmark. Laura, can you hear okay? Yeah, I can. Thank you, Brittany. And thank you, Stan. And hello, everybody. Um, glad to be here today and share with you um, the piece, I guess, that you can see here. It's a little blurry, Brittany or Stan. I don't know if you can make it a little clearer from my side anyway. It looks blurry. Uh, yeah, I was getting better there. Still there, but I can I can speak anyways. Um, yeah, this one I had created uh, for actually last September. On September 11th, I was invited to uh, demo for the patrons at the Vernon Philly by Brittany and Stan. Uh, good, thank you. That's much better. Um, and I created this piece for them as a as a kind of demo example. And I started with this one in a kind of reverse fashion where um, it, the idea was painting a portrait from dark to light. So I started with the whole canvas covered in darker pigment actually here um yeah it was a transparent red oxide with black and um from there i started to pull the color and the light out to create the the form you know the face and so it was a very fun uh demo i enjoyed sharing the process with the few that could be there of course because of of covid the situation had to change but um yeah and then after that i had continued working on it and um finished you know adding i know here you can't really see that there's gold leaf on the coins in her headdress um the image i found compelling she was a algerian young girl and i really liked the intensity in her eyes for me the eyes in my artwork are always very important they kind of act like i do a lot of portraiture mostly um and the eyes really act like to me the gateway or the doorway to go within and explore so i usually put a lot of um the direction or focus in toward the eyes so that's kind of um the idea with with this one and how that was created and i do have on youtube if you guys are uh, with youtube or whatever can check that out i have the process um because uh, uh stan and Brittany uploaded it there so if you want to watch for some reason for fun <laughs> the demo of how i did that you can see it there how it gets started and i have put a few other videos up of the uh process where i um and putting the gold leaf on and, and the other parts too. So it's it's there on YouTube under my name, Laura Cruzmark, I have it. And also the one that I demoed for the Vernon Philly is under their YouTube. So yeah, I think unless you guys have any questions about that, I can answer. Otherwise I can just explain briefly about the other one if you want. I don't know what works best, Brittany. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Um, her other painting is right next door, so we might go there you go thank you that's the one on the flyer you've probably seen but this one i did a few years back and it was um yeah it's a little washed out there but the, with the light but um the intensity about this one was i was living in la at the time actually and i was really missing the uh very cold fierce winters like we get here sometimes in kansas very short even like this winter we had a very cold week and there was something really magical that i wanted to capture again in that uh cold intense energy so she was a, a portraiture representing this kind of very um windy and cold and yeah energy and i was also at this point teaching myself glazing um i had learned from uh bethany college actually next to the sand zane galleries where i studied um and i was uh, actually later on teaching myself some glazing techniques because i had only learned all the prima painting so i was 
um, kind of testing my techniques there with with the glazing. So that was this one and, and the idea of, again, putting the intention as the eyes being the gateway to kind of go within the portrait. So um, yeah, that's why I call this one Spirit of Winter because I was really wanting to capture that kind of um, wild cold winter. So that's that one. And um, it's all oil again. The other one was oil as well on, um, this one's on wood panel. The other one was on linen, uh, linen, linen canvas panel. So I think my time is probably up. That's about like five minutes. If if you guys have any questions or I don't know how it works from here, Brittany, you can tell me. Perfect. Thank you, Laura. That was beautiful. Um, I'm, if anyone posts a question in the in the chat, I will announce it to the artist. Or if uh, if you'd like, you also may just unmute yourself and ask away. We'll just give you a quick minute here, and then we're going to do a quick panel around the room while we see if there's any questions. Stan's gonna. Okay. How'd you do the gold leaf? Yeah, the gold, the gold leaf on the coins. I, I actually put a first color down like a, I usually like to do that, like a yellow okra and then let it dry after, you know, a, a week or so. And then I put the gold leaf with, um, I use what's called Mona Lisa size. It's like a glue for the gold leaf. And then I apply the gold leaf after the size is a little bit tacky. Actually, I have that video on YouTube. On my YouTube, there's a little video. Yeah. And I kind of do a time lapse so you don't have to sit and watch me do the whole, you know, process. But and then actually on top of the gold leaf, I paint more oil because I want the gold leaf to look a little older. I want those coins to look kind of old. So I don't want that super shiny, shiny gold. So I paint uh, oil painting on, on top of it just a little bit and sometimes scratch even into it to make design. So it has uh, like texture in, into it. Those are very strong, thoughtful pieces. <laughs> very good Thank stuff. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you can actually sense the cold in that second piece. Yeah, that second piece is awesome. Thank yeah, you. That's great. Yeah, I was thinking that when we had that really cold week here, at least in, in around Pratt, we had that like minus 29 wind chill. I was like, okay, that's yeah. the feeling. <laughs> so you're to blame. <laughs> yeah. Lot, yeah. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> no, it's her. I had the great opportunity yesterday of viewing your paintings in person. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Oh, they're just gorgeous. And um, the eyes are so mysterious. How do you get that effect? Uh, thank you so much. I'm glad you were able to see them in person. But um, yeah, the eyes, um, you know, I had learned something actually when, when I was first studying the Spirit of Winter one and, and testing some techniques. I learned that Leonardo da Vinci, um, he said he used a technique which he called infusion, which I've never heard any art teacher or artist uh, talk about. But basically what it is, is you connect through the painting as it's a, it's a person. Basically, I see this painting being a real live person after a while. And it's funny thing, because in my studio, I'll know when it's finished or when she's alive enough, because she actually kind of winks at me. There's like this sparkle in the eyes that happened that I'm like, okay, she, she's there. She's embodied in the painting. And Leonardo da Vinci spoke about this with the Mona Lisa and with other ones he would do. He would basically send the because everything is energy right paintings we are everything so we'd send the energy through the eyes and through the the being and basically infuse it kind of with life beyond just oil you know on the canvas so that's it's really about my intention and and also painting them in a way that the the viewer's attention really goes to the eyes well so, very well done yeah thank you so much mm -hmm. It's so fun to hear you all talk. Can everyone hear me any better? Any other questions? Brittany, are you there? Can you guys hear, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me now? I'm so sorry about this issue. Thank you. It's, it's fun to hear you all talk. Uh, we are going to next go to Sue Godwin. Hello. Hope everybody's doing well. And that's nice. Yes. I love a painting. So this is um, called View from Coronado Heights, quite a literal title. Um, but uh, it was, um, I'm not, let me back up. I'm not 
an original Kansan. Uh, we've been here 20 years now, um, but I have, and I live in McPherson, so Lindsborg is not too far for me. Uh, and I've taken many trips up there and just absolutely love, I don't think I could ever get tired of Coronado Heights. Um, it's gorgeous, 360 degree views, uh, different times of day, different atmospheres. Um, it's just beautiful sunrise to sunset. Um, and uh, this particular day, that sky really happened. It was those wispy cirrus that looked like they were dancing. And, uh, you know, the, the, it'd been a, a dry summer. Um, so, you know, the grasses on the hill were, were getting a little singed and um, not quite as a brilliant green, but um, it was uh, really a pretty view to me. So there was still enough water to have a, a little pond um, there but uh, it was when summer was starting to heat up. So um, I paint in acrylic um, since I was probably 10 years old. My mom was an artist. Uh, so she painted in acrylic and, and I guess that's just where I picked it up. And my, my high school art teacher, Al Masig, he was always um, really great about letting us just kind of experiment with whatever medium. I mean, he would he would do some assignments um, with something specific, but that's really where it got built was um, just my experience with my mom and in high school and, and college. But in college, I, I actually went to college and, and did graphic art. Um, this was pre-computer, uh, so I'm not a computer graphic artist, really, per se. I'm more hands-on, cut and paste, um, but uh, I've been fortunate to be able to get back into uh, fine art full-time, so um, my husband makes my frames. Um, it's kind of like uh, the Model T, you can get anything as long as it's black. I really like the way the black sets it off. And he uh, designed it because I do paint the same amount of detail on all sides, um, an angled inner cut on that frame so that your eye can actually see the sides. You know, you, you get kind of led into the sides as well. Um, so. I just like the kind of cohesive look when when I have multiple paintings together that they're all presented in the same way. Does anyone have any questions? It looks windy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, it was typical Kansas day. Yeah. And up there on Coronado Heights, it can get pretty windy. But yeah, um, the wind was really creating those wisps in the clouds. Um, on a typical sunny day, I will undertone the sky in a white and um, kind of a, it, it creates with a, a lemon yellow look underneath. Cause if, if you look at the sky on a, a lot of times on a sunny day along the horizon, it's, it's not just blue. Um, it kind of gradates from that kind of warmer, uh, pale, pale yellow, almost greenish into, as you go up into the atmosphere, into the blues. And then the ground, I'll typically um, do burnt sienna, um, red oxide mix. Um, it just gives it a little bit more depth, I think. So. Did you do the painting in plain air? No, I didn't. Um, I have found even with doing um, slow dry blending gel 
and and other mediums to try to extend um, the open time. Um, I used Liquitex heavy body for the most part, and um, in fact, really pretty primarily. Um, it's just hard to keep it workable. And in the Kansas wind, I just yeah. <laughs> haven't really, I, I need to get out there more to do plein air, but um, no, for the most help. part, I'll take reference photos. I'll do sketches um, with oil pastel. Um, and then I'll work from, from that. Um, I'll do the, the sketches on site and make reference notes uh, regarding atmosphere, time of day, um, just things that I see. Yeah. You got the depth back so tremendous. I seeing it in a person, I, I just thought, well, you're sitting right there painting it because it just went way back. It's really beautiful. Oh, I really appreciate that. And and I and I really do work to try to create that. Um, I and I think this helps having had a graphic art background because back in the day um, when I was doing that, you, you literally had to create your key lines in layers, in four color process layers. And a lot of times that meant working back to front. And so uh, that's what I typically do with a painting. I'll do the sky first. Uh, now there may be little additions that I'll do to the sky after I have the, the ground done, but for the most part, the sky is pretty well done um, when I start into the ground. And I work from the horizon line forward. Um, it's just- It's your procedure. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's, just, it's just how I work. And then I'll go back and, and kind of, there's, there's some areas where I kind of almost like have to knit the two to, you know, like the foreground a little bit better with the mid ground and, and on back. But, but um, from the start, I, I start at the background and work forward. It's beautiful. It brings back so many good memories. I went to Bethany College and I'd hike to Coronado like every day almost because I'm yeah. a walker. I love to walk. And so I know this view very well and you captured it beautifully. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I did use a little bit of palette knife in the rocks. Um, so that was that was good. Um, I want to start really getting more into palette knife. Um, and some some thicker paint applications. Um, so I'm working on one now that that's being utilized a little bit more. Awesome, thank you, Sue. Okay, next we're gonna move to Luke. Like sophisticated color in your panorama. It's, I really like the color. It's, that's just the way that, I don't know how accurate and it doesn't matter to me. It just all works. It all works very well to me. So that's a nice piece. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I try to paint what I see. Right. So there, there's not a whole lot of um, stuff that I that I change that I alter as far as color or tone. All right. All right. Is this yours? So, but I really appreciate that. That's good to know. Awesome. Thank you. I don't know if you guys can hear me. A little bit. Okay, little. Okay, we're going to move to Lucy Yuki next. Thank you so much, Sue. Lucy, I know Thank you. you. I, I really uh, appreciate being a part of this beautiful show. Thank you. Well, I think it's um, kind of fitting that. Um, that I follow Sue because I am still working as a graphic designer. I am retiring and um, I have uh, done some studio work in the past and I'm looking forward to getting into that again. Oh. I find that the, um, the studio work is so much different than graphic design and I'm kind of, I, I hats off to Sue because 
doing it without a computer, I can't imagine uh, the thought processes, but right now I'm kind of trying to loosen up and get myself away from everything being on a grid, everything being about uh, information, mm -hmm. everything um, being uh, product driven instead of process driven. So uh, I feel like I'm kind of trying to blow some cobwebs away. Um, I started painting with Rex Hall. I don't know some of you who are older might uh, know that name. He was a, an instructor at Emporia State and was very in, um, influential to me. I like, I like the freedom to do things that are a little bit more emotive and um, not necessarily technically accurate. So I really appreciate, Sue, what you do with your, um, your more careful interpretation, whereas I'm, I take a, usually a photograph and just kind of start making things up. Hopefully- And it, see, I, I have such an appreciation for what you do. I love this piece. My, I would like to get to that kind of more loose style someday. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm trying to get even more loose. I don't know how many of you know Zach Barnes. I don't personally know him, but he's a painter. Mm -hmm in Chase County. Yeah. I love to paint landscapes like Zach Barnes, but I'm not there yet. And I, you know, well, we're all different, but I really uh, have a real love of color from Rex. Uh, you know, he was quite the um, taskmaster in some ways. And, you know, you couldn't ever have any black or gray on your palette and right. you had to figure it all out. And you always knew you'd done something good when he walked up to your painting and swore. That was always, that was like, uh, that, that likes it. <laughs> he just, um, so on this one, I call this one fall fanfare because it just reminds me of the clouds that you see over the Flint Hills in the fall. And I, um, I do pretty vivid underpainting. For example, that coral line, um, at the horizon, that was pretty much the underpainting color for all of the of the whole sky. Oh wow! And then the um, the grasses had pretty much a combination of um, acro violet and um, burnt sienna, and with some uh, violet in there. So I really kind of, in some ways, like Laura was talking about, I work from dark to light, and because of that, there's a lot of layers on there. And mm -hmm. my other challenge is, and I think Sue, maybe you can, uh, everybody can relate to this is, I don't know when to quit. And um, Rex used to just come take things away from me. Uh, my paintings don't wink, unfortunately. <laughs> it's just kind of like, um, yeah, I can keep messing with it forever. And I, I have to get over that. Um, that's why I like the little study that's also in the, in the show, that was my first canvas back in the studio. I finally um, rented studio space this summer. That was my first canvas back in the studio and I spent an hour on it and I'm, I'm happy with it. And so that is the kind of thing that I really hope to, like you're talking about to get this, this little piece right here. The, the um, That's just a small eight by 10 and I had a lot of fun with that. and. Hope to get a little bit more of that looseness even more into my to my paintings. I'm currently working in acrylics because I, um, I'm kind of a magpie when it comes to, to art. I like to do interiors and I like to do, I have some ideas for some other more abstract stuff going on. But for me, landscapes are kind of my home base and I, I Sometimes I think of them as uh, paintings, you know, that's the piano equivalent of doing your scales. Um, just kind of clearing your, if you're, especially if I'm working on an interior or doing something that is um, a little bit more intricate, going back and just, you know, blowing it all out on, on a canvas with a landscape is just really clears my head. So I, I'll never give those up and, um, because I, right now, I, in the past, I learned to work, Sue, I don't know, you learned from your mother. I, 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 did. I started painting um, in a studio when I was pregnant. And so acrylics were the only option. And um, 
I've yeah. since, I've since painted some in, in uh, oil. Yeah. In fact, here's here's a photo. This like the earliest oh. art experience of mine. That's my mom drawing on the beach in northern Michigan and me. There you are. <laughs> yep. So That's great. But I, think uh, I mean, really, this this piece is just so lovely. It's it just I love the looseness and to be able to see this done in acrylic. Um, I admire oil painters. Um, that's a process I don't see myself ever going, but to be able to get that kind of looseness in acrylic, um, that's one of my goals. Well, it can so. be done. I don't, I don't know if you know Kelly Crawlman. I think she's got a show coming. Yeah. Up. Yeah. Um, she, I saw her at in Emporia and she goes back and forth oil acrylic. It's, it almost, you can't tell them until you get real close that she's even switched mediums. So it can be yeah. done. And um, I, I appreciate the encouragement to keep doing more of the looseness. It's, what I'm really learning is how to translate the, the looseness on this small piece to a bigger size. And right now I'm working on a, a big 48 by 36 canvas for my sister and it's kind of kicking my butt. <laughs> so I, I, I keep tightening, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter and I don't want, and I have to go back and make it, you know, make a new mark that's loose because uh -huh. it needs Get to bigger be brushes. Yeah, well, yeah, and <laughs> I'm horrible about being stingy about paint. That was one thing I got chastised all the time, squirt some paint out and let it stay there. And I think, but it costs so much money. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Is it that's? I think my time. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, and I'll apologize in advance. I've got another meeting at one o'clock, so I will listen to the recording and love hearing everyone else's uh, thoughts. Awesome! Thank you, Ruthie. Beautiful. Next, we're gonna move to Mike Flair. I like your understated style. I'm trying to loosen up. Maybe we're all trying to loosen up, or at least I am. <laughs> That's good stuff. Thank you. I find that too. And it is true, the big brushes, you can't get too tight if you have a bigger brush. And I also learned, uh, the watching others, that if you hold your hand back further on the brush, I would always do this too, because again, in my work, I'm like always wanting to do this, but the further you hold your hand back on the handle of the brush, it kind of lets your arm get loose too you know so i i think mm -hmm. that's yeah a common thing with a lot of artists and knowing when to stop i have that too oh, you know, man, you said it's it like right there yeah you always think you could add something better and then you're like oh man i shouldn't you can't just press delete like on a computer you know you just, you'll do something else so i was yeah. at a workshop where the artist instructed us all to take a bamboo stick and tape that to the end of our paintbrush and you'd stand back about three feet and paint with that so you oh, couldn't yeah. real tight, you know, you had to be loose with it. So that yeah. was a good lesson. It is. It's very good. Also, if you oh, use your other hand. Other hand. Yeah. 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 Other hand is, uh, is yeah, they say it taps into the different side of your brain too, the unconscious. So, yeah. This is great. Boy. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful words. I really enjoyed seeing them. If I tip up, you can see like my first like. Flint Hills landscape ever? I can't well, maybe not enough light. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's I, I was like seven months pregnant and painting away, and it was great. Wow. <laughs> so, so great. You started then. I love that. <laughs> Creative. All right, Mike, can you see your piece okay? Oh, what? Bit neither. Can any, can you we lose her? Okay. Mike, I don't know what happened here. Brittany? Stan? <laughs> I think we're on what? our own. Okay, it's a party. No. They've closed up. <laughs> Just let the camera run. Yeah. Mm -hmm. any, well, I'm enjoying it. Me? 
yeah. it's just okay. recording us anyway there was a cute little thing where the students were all on zoom together and the teacher somehow disappeared and it cut off the tech cut off and all the students started talking themselves they were only like in second grade and they started talking they were hungry and one was like i want some toast and bake and the other one was like yeah that'd be great and they, they were just going on about these funny things and they didn't know they were really being recorded i guess it was so funny mm -hmm. yeah so can you guys wow. hear me? Can you guys hear me? I can hear yes. you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, my picture went away, so that's why I thought, well, maybe I'm off, but I can hear you guys. Okay. Oh, he's, it, Brittany says we're on. You guys can't hear us. <laughs> it's like what I said. She can't hear. Uh, I guess uh, we just can't hear them, but they can hear uh, us. Okay. Okay. So, Mike, uh, would you like to talk about your piece? I lost my picture. I can't see anything. Uh, I I remember the painting though. Can you guys can you, can you see me and hear me? Let yes, me see please. you and hear you. Yes. Yes. Uh, is your piece up in the image there, Mike? Is it the the one with the guitars? Yeah, I, I remember the piece. It's not in front of me. I you can I, click, I can click on speak speaker to, view if you go to the upper right hand corner. I think if you click there, it'll should show you and the rest of us, but also your image, I think. Yeah, that's not it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. anyway, I'm a, I'm a moron when it comes to this stuff. <clears throat> anyway, no, um, uh, that's an acrylic painting. It's a 30 by 40, I think. Um, I'm a watercolorist, actually, I was for years. My dad is a member of the American Watercolor Society and a former greeting card designer at American Greetings. So when I grew up, when I grew up in Northern Ohio, I, uh, all of our friends were artists. The guy who did the Ziggy character, old Tom Wilson was him and his, you know, his kids were, everybody was an artist, you know, when we were, when we were kids. So my first love has always been watercolor. And so getting, doing a loose watercolors, uh, you know, part of the, the way I teach, I'm always saying we're, trying to create light with the tools of darkness and so and when you've got uh when you hit it when you can hit it once and get the same thing across why do it 20 times which i mean you know you can uh, you can go into all kinds of a debate with that what i do with acrylic is try to again try to keep it understated and this, that one the big the big one that uh the 30 by 40 vertical of the musicians i did a whole lot of that with a brayer well, I mean, I was just trying to get some effects in there and trying to keep it consistent side to side and top to top, uh, top to bottom, the consistent handling of the of the medium and still trying to get across this, uh, uh, you know, the, the figures. I have, uh, I play the bass a little bit. <laughs> I used to, back in the, back in my wilder days, I was a bass player for a, a blues band. Well, one of them, one of the bands I was in was a blues band. That's the one I liked the best. But I, I always like, for design's sake, when I'm doing figures, like I say, try to do some sort of an understated approach to uh, to figures. So a lot of times I'll do figures with, with umbrellas, you know, and something about the, the closeness of people in the, in, you know, with the inclement uh, weather. But I since then started doing some stuff with musicians. And the thing about a stand-up bass is you have an instant vertical when you're uh, in your design. So I've been doing a lot of that. That painting that I that I guess we're looking at because I sure as hell can't see it. Um, I don't see it. I'm I'm trying to message uh, Brittany. Um, I think Brittany, if you can hear from this side, uh, it's showing in the tiny little box. But when Mike is speaking, it's highlighting him. So. Um, yeah, it shows on her screen, but I think you have to switch between speaker view and highlight or something. I'm not 100% sure, but I, I know we all see Mike when he's speaking, but then the picture oh, doesn't show up. <laughs> Let's see the picture. <laughs> I know which painting it is, Yeah, yeah. Um, but I can't see it right now. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway. Can you guys click on in the upper right-hand corner, um, if you click, you you'll on uh, the little icon you'll see all of mm -hmm. us plus the image that Brittany shows which is Mike's painting yeah. so is that gallery view 
Gallery view. Yeah, yeah. Click gallery view. You can toggle okay. between yep. gallery and speaker view. And if you do that, you'll see under Brittany's name. Yeah, you see that Got it. Mike's painting. Hmm. I'm gonna have to leave. Thanks, guys, yeah. so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Great Beautiful work. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, can we see it now? Ah, there, there we is. go. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. There we go. Yep. There. Now we can see it. Yay. Okay. I can't, but that's all right. Uh, oh, can okay, Mike? It's hey, a great picture. Great uh, picture. Uh, got any questions? We got so somebody says, I was doing a demonstration one time and I had a bunch of people in there. I think I was about to put them to sleep. And I said, you got any questions? This buddy of mine says, yeah, who cut your hair? <laughs> <laughs> so is, is some of that done with a palette knife? No, I, you know, I don't, man, maybe I've got a palette knife. I never gets used. I, it was a brayer. It was uh, one of those little rollers. And I, oh, got, yeah, okay. and I got up to my elbows in it, trying to just get some different, uh, oh, I don't know light and dark patterns in there that seem to be instead of thoughtful it's more of a and it's just a real rapid expression is what i tried to get across i didn't like that painting for a long time and finally when i i got it to uh, where it would read the the narrative came across finally without without being too heavy-handed with with the way i was handling the medium and again i'm not uh, Next time I'm going to do a better one, <laughs> but it's pretty good, I think. Um, well, it added some texture to it. That's what I was wondering it, how you. Did that yeah, yeah, that's the fun part. Getting that stuff, getting that stuff together, trying to make heads or tails of it is, uh, you know, again, we're trying to create light with the tools of darkness. I always like that saying. I don't know. I kind of hang. I out. always find that it. Um, Every painting I, I disliked for quite a while <laughs> until I keep yeah. going. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You know, I think I, that almost turned white a couple of times. I said, I turned it, I turned it upside down. I look at it in the mirror. I'm going, I don't know what's wrong. What, what don't I like about it? You know, we all do that, I suppose, when, especially when you're, you know, this thing kind of has a being of its own. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking, you're talking about those head studies and stuff. You know, you're looking, this person's looking right back at you. And I've done, I haven't done much in the way of portrait portraiture um what i did do i painted billboards for a year back in the 80s <laughs> they don't even have paint billboards anymore but i learned how to that's the only time i've really painted with oil and it was outdoor advertising oil and the only difference between that and the stuff you guys use is this got lead in it <laughs> and mm -hmm. so we we it was a you know buyer or the artist beware type of thing and i it was you're looking at, I did a picture of Paul Harvey where his eyeball was as big as your head. We were doing 14, 48 billboards. And, you know, you look back and say, this guy's looking right at you. And you're trying to get the depth in his, in his eyes. And then you get off the stage, you come down and get, get a look at it. Learning how to paint big was, was an eye opener. And I learned the, the technique of painting signs. I'm not a great sign painter. I just know how to do them. And it would take a lot of practice for me to get you know, get the lick back, you know, and get the right brushes and so forth. So my experience with oils, that's what, that's where it's at. Um, I started to paint some oils. <clears throat> Between you and me, I'm a mess with oils. That stuff gets on everything for me <laughs> because it never dries. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm a mobile guy. I'm a, I've been called a gypsy. Well, I'm not going to go there, but I've been around a little bit and <laughs> that's, I mean, uh, stuff that dries fast suits me. Uh, you know, I'm built for comfort. I ain't built for speed. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean with the whole getting messy. I would just go uh, look at my painting and then all of a sudden I'd have, you know, stuff everywhere. I'm like, what? How do you keep that stuff clean? Oh my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, we used to put Jap dryer with a uh, Japanese dryer. I shouldn't call it Jap dryer. That's what we called it. Uh, with uh, the linseed oil when we we'd thin, thin the, the, the oils down so it would dry a little faster. 
because we had to, you know, it had to go out on location. We were doing, like I said, their butler panels, 14 by 48 butler panels, and we were doing faces. Now, the other stuff was it was bulletin enamel, and that stuff would dry in like 24 hours. You could, you could take it apart and bang those panels together, and it's oil-based, but it, at least it's like enamel. That oil, that uh, outdoor advertising oil took forever to dry if you don't use the Japanese dryer. I said, why doesn't everybody use it? And they said, because it turns your whites, it will turn them yellow. And I said, well, it doesn't matter to us because this billboard's only going to be alive for six months. So that's one of the practical, you know, practical things of uh, painting pictures. Anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I love the points of color that you bring in. I do feel the jazz and the energy in the, this painting and the, the blue is just really fascinating me underneath the little bit of the uh, the guitar that the central figure has, but also the little bits of uh, yellow. But there's something nice about that that really feels, I'm a musician too, I'm a classical pianist, but still I feel this music in there with the color notes. They're like notes, you know? So I really, I really like that the, you captured that in there, so. Yeah, they really make your eye move around the painting. Yeah. Great, that's a great observation. That's, I mean, I, I tried to indicate that because the last thing I wanted to do is make some, I don't know, I guess it'd be okay to keep it, you know, somewhat gray or a monochromatic type of thing, but I like to splash color in there. And it, again, it, it can be so easily overdone. And thank you that moving your eye around, that's what it's for to me. You know, that's the way I look at it anyway. Thank you. Color notes. I'm going to remember that. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I like to say like color symphonies, color notes. Yeah. 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 That's really like, there. it so, so ties into painting. I know music and art is like that, you know, works so well together and you can see it in the color frequencies. I even call them color frequencies because they oh, have yeah. a resonance to them, you know, that sound or feel a certain way and you can really, yeah. uh, play a lot with that with you know your paintings yeah. I cannot paint without listening to music yeah. I really can't it's such a great comedy and it really takes you into it I notice more I've tried to before without or listening to something else like more logical that just doesn't work <laughs> you know you gotta, it, it kind of pulls you into the creative process with the music yeah mm -hmm. yeah I, I talked to musicians and I didn't start playing music until I was what, 37 or whatever it was and I and uh, I thought, well, you know, practice what you preach. You're going to get, I mean, we all, it's all, we're all self-taught. I don't care how many degrees you got. You had to get in the studio and be willing to make the mistakes and trial and error is always going to be the, be the teacher. And so that's what I did. Plunk, 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 damn it. Plunk, plunk, what in the darn, plunk, does this, does my fingers <laughs> ever stop hurting? You know, one of those type of things. And I said, okay, like I say, keep doing it, keep doing it. And finally I got the hang of it. And I realized that painting deals with space and music deals with time, the relationships and the textures, like you said, with, the, with this, I mean, the, the color identifying notes, that's cool. That's very cool. And I, I know that there's a similarity there that, uh, and I'm like you, I like a studio. I've, I've painted on location. I'd rather sketch on location, get it to a studio and turn up some raikut or, or something you know put some music i mean i like it loud too so yeah. that's just that's just me that's awesome i'm i'm gonna be kind of the the moderator for britney because she we can't hear her and so basically we have about little more than half an hour left and let's see we have um chris next and i think britney will pull up the um the image they're just going to be still images for right now because she said stan unplugged the computer has the technical issues. So uh, Chris, and then we'll do Ron, and then Curtis, and then Kay. So we have like four four more other artists with you guys left and about a half an hour before the recording ends. So thank so you for indulging me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was wonderful. I appreciate really, it. Really great painting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. So Chris, I think. This piece. Yeah, well, I unmuted myself, so I'm assuming you can hear me. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. <laughs> yes. Um, I really appreciate uh, what Brittany, I'm assuming, did with these daisies. Uh, this is a piece that was just the three daisies. And I called it uh, Daddy's Daisies. And there's a story there. Um, 
in that my dad grew daisies in um, in our yard, a family home, in order to have centerpieces for uh, my wedding, which is, oh gosh, nearly 50 years ago. Um, and so the centers of these daisies are not yellow. If you look in back of me, I've, I have um, perfected the virtual background on Zoom now. So I have a one of my pieces in back of me and I'm superimposed on in top of it. And there are some, you know, more normal daisies <laughs> in that piece. Uh, but these have a wedding fabric, satin and lace and stuff as the centers, just to make them a little bit more music, more whimsical. I started making uh, fabric flowers, oh gosh, more than 10 years ago, sort of on a whim. Uh, somebody gave me a book about how to do this and I didn't like the instructions. Uh, what I do is probably technically, like they're technically quilts because if you know the definition of a quilt, a quilt has three layers. So all of my flowers and I've expanded from one species to another, uh, all my flowers have some kind of um, layer in the middle and then their fabric on the outside. Uh, the other thing that kind of makes these belong to my daddy is the fact that each of the ribs in the petals is a piece of wire. And that means that they can be bent mm. a little bit more life to them. Um, one of the things that I know because I only deal in fabric and thread is that I can't do, I, I've really been enjoying listening to all the painters who have a lot of subtlety in their work. It's really hard to be subtle when you're not shading and it's hard to shade with my materials. Um, but uh, there's that. And then the other piece that I'm gonna show is the poppy. I don't know if Brittany can bring that up. I think she will, yeah. The poppy is in some ways very similar. One of my big challenges is to mimic nature. And I don't try too terribly hard, but I try to mimic nature. Oh, here we are. Yeah. You're gonna recognize that's a poppy. And you're gonna recognize that those are daisies. Uh, so far I've been doing um, pansies. Right now I'm working on, I could show you this. I'm working on um, water lilies. I sort of got the, these things tend, when I have those false backgrounds and hold something up, it sometimes blends in. But I put it in front of my face. <laughs> <laughs> and, it does, but, and I can show Very you. Cool. There's yeah. wire in all of these. I have to hold it up higher. There's wire so that I can you know, bend that however I want it to be. Um, I, also, mm -hmm. I didn't. Bring I didn't bring a lily pad in here, but I make a lot of leaves too. You can see some of the leaves behind me. Mm -hmm. um, let's put the wire in because that makes it. And then I know somebody talked about their art teacher. So my art teacher, the one thing I'll remember from that 50 plus years ago is that he always said, if it works, use it. And so my pieces are fabric and, and thread but then the big challenge is always the center. Mm. How am I going to make that center look something like what the real, again, it, it mostly has to do with um, that you'd recognize that this is a water lily and not a poppy. For mm -hmm. um, and so I use a variety of materials uh, and all of my materials are recycled. I have now practically a room full of fabrics because I started out with the fabric that was left over from my own home sewing, from my mom, from her forebears. I think she she kept everything. I will keep everything. And the other day when I was really struggling, what does the inside of a water lily look like that's different from the inside of a poppy? Um, I found this in my old stuff. I don't even know what it is. I think it's crepe paper string. They uh, probably don't make it anymore. 
I, that's what I've been cutting up into tiny little pieces and then sewing so that I can make those centers. Wow. It gets time consuming because I'm really, I'm, I'm really wanted to, wanting it to mimic what I see. So I really, that this is not the kind of art that any of the rest of the artists in the show do. Yeah, um, but, um, I use my sewing machine a lot. Um, when I'm working with wire, I break a lot of sewing machine needles. So I don't know if anybody has any questions. I just want to say I love how you, you know, really observing each different flower and figuring out creative ways to capture that difference, you know, and in this case, the poppy here, the beads, they work so well, you know, and, and it really gives a lot of dimension too, because when the light hits it, it creates the shadows, you know, just like it would if you were to see a real poppy. So I think it's beautiful to see the creativity in, in that. And also when you had the lily up, I thought, oh, you could also use those as like these cool brooches. I used to do fashion design as well. And so, of course, these kind of things like on dresses or in hats, you know, they would be very cool because you can bend them, you know, and make them. I had a, a friend that did the Project Runway show and she did a whole dress of all these flowers, kind of like you created here with the fabric and they were bendable. And I just thought of that would be another fun way to play. I'm, I make wearable art. Uh -huh. <laughs> that makes it. Yeah, that makes perfect. Uh -huh. And this has wire in it, too. Uh huh you know so that that can be bent but that what i like about these sorts of things is because they're made out of fabric they're lightweight yeah if, if that was glass like a lot of big jewelry is you know you'd be <laughs> you'd be bending over from the weight of that necklace but exactly uh, and the other the other thing because i have so many materials really people have given me you know all the fabric left from the draperies in their house my brother-in-law was an upholsterer, so I have a lot of stuff left from that. Um, when I first started making poppies, it was the inspiration of the fabric that this is not one of those. But the very first poppy that I made is real shiny. And some of the artists here are old enough to remember the old-fashioned poppies that the um, American Legion, I think it was, handed out. Yeah. Yep. Lots of flowers, but they were like waxed, um, shiny fabric, why, mm -hmm. or shiny cardboard. So that is what I had this shiny red fabric, and I thought well, that looks just like that. And so a lot of times the fabric or trims, the thing that's in back of me, I have a lot of old bias tape in that and ribbons. You know, those things tell me what they are. Yeah. So. Wonderful. Well, if there's any other questions, I think we have to move on to the next couple other artists before the recording ends at 1.30. So um, thank you so much, Chris. Um, I think Brittany's going to pull the next one up, uh, Ron. And also wishing Ron big congratulations as he won um, second place. So. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. It was quite the honor. Yeah. I'm really appreciative of it. So, yeah, this is the piece that got the award, and it's called Ever Evolving Self Portrait, which, if you look at me, you're probably not going to think, oh, Ron looks just like this piece that I'm looking at. Yeah. So, What's looking in the mirror. <laughs> or at least I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> So this was more of a kind of an emotional response, I guess you'd say. Um, most of my work, I'm primarily a ceramist, but I also like to include wood and stone. And so the base of this piece is limestone and it's called shell limestone. And most of all of these things I found just out in, in nature. So the shell limestone I found at a location a little bit probably northwest of Concordia. There was this, they were doing some, some excavating and a, a couple of these big chunks of rocks were on the side of the road. So I was able to pick that up. And then the, the rounded form, kind of the vessel form is made out of native Kansas clay. Um, I do mix some other elements in there to create that. 
but I always, when I was making this piece, I always think of ourselves as vessels in essence. So that's why we have a vessel form in there. And there is some writing on some of the pieces, just some of my favorite sayings. Um, I can't think of any that come right to mind, but it's really kind of the way I work. And there is actually a little profile self-portrait on the interior of the piece. So it does have a more of a literal self-portrait as well. Uh, let's see, what else? There's some twine involved as well. And one thing I do like about this piece is I tried to create some tension. So it almost looks like that. The rounded form is kind of tipping off of the stone. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of held on there by the, the other little piece on the, on the edge. So I'm not sure what else to say. Um, if anybody has any questions, I really do, as you can tell, I really, and the, the reason it's called ever evolving self-portrait is every year or so I'll kind of pull it out and make some changes. Like the last time I, I did more carving on the stone, I thought the stone was a little too big and bulky. So I do continually make changes. I've also changed the twine and other things. So just like ourselves, we're always kind of evolving and changing. And you know, most artists, when they look at their past work, they're thinking, man, if I could just go back and change a little something, I would really like to do that. Or even throw it away in my case. There's a lot of pieces I look at and I'm like, oh my God, eh, I should just toss that in the <laughs> trash heap. <laughs> so this one will probably, I don't know if it'll continue to change after this show, but that was kind of the idea behind the piece. So I'm happy to answer any questions. So how is it actually held on the rock? So there are, I placed bolts into the rock and then it's bolted on. So the, oh. so the, the ceramic piece is bolted on to the limestone. Okay. So I usually I'll drill holes and then I'll put some um, threaded bolts in there and everybody's favorite, the JB weld is what kind of holds them in place. So if you ever have anything that needs to stuck together, I once had a ceramics professor that told me his dentures broke in half and he actually was able to glue them with JB weld. <laughs> he said it looked horrible, but it was, they held really well and they still work. So it's a good epoxy. So can you see the bolt um, from the looking inside the vessel no and that's that's actually covered up by a piece of wood that has my profile self-portrait it's kind of a little pointillist self-portrait on the inside ah nice so i do try to kind of cover them up i don't you know i'm not i'm not a, opposed to showing how things are held together but i just thought it made it a little more interesting that way yeah yeah for sure because like on the other piece that's in the show it's clear how the pieces are bolted on to the, to the main stone and the base as well. And a lot of it is just, you know, using design elements to try to keep things together. Yeah, so here's the other piece that's in the show. Uh -huh. You can see there's some JB Weld that's gluing pieces together in that. So JB Weld is, not that I'm a spokesman for JB Weld, but it does work. <laughs> wonders and this one's called megatropolis just because i couldn't come up with any other title i just thought it was kind of a it's one of those pieces that to me is kind of over the top and it was one that i really didn't know how it would come together until it was finished and the one thing i always like to make notice of is you know a lot of my work's based on my mistakes you know so like clay will crack or break so I try to work with that, or if it doesn't come out the way I like it, I try to be able to alter it in some form or fashion after it's done. So whenever you look at my stuff, just try to pick out the mistakes that I tried to repair. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good symbolism with, with life. Like you said, you're ever evolving self yeah, like really. Mistakes. Okay, let's fix that. Okay, we make right. another mistake. Okay, let's fix that. And that's just our, our nature, right? Because we're here experiencing life. So I think that's a beautiful reflection in your work. And 
I can see that in the other uh, with the the being yourself as a vessel. I think that's so symbolic, and um, I really like that. And I notice it also has holes in it too, which is kind of interesting yes. to the, the the personality, you know, the psyche as far as again fixing those those things in in ourselves and always wanting to be better in a way. So, yeah. Very cool. And a lot of people always ask me about the holes because most of my pieces have some kind of holes. And for one thing, it's just a nice design element, kind of breaks up the, the surface area. But also I think of like the ground is filled with earthworm holes and holes just go through everything. So that's kind of my inspiration for that. Uh-huh. Beautiful. Black holes in the galaxies too, you know, everywhere. That's right. <laughs> As above, so below. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for listening. That's great. I just awesome. really enjoyed cool. it. Thank you yeah. so much, Ron. Uh, the, the next uh, uh, we have is Curtis. And um, I think Brittany will pull up your work. Let's see. OK. It's there. Yes. All right. Thank you very much for allowing me to do this. This is great, not only looking at fantastic artwork and hearing about its creation, but learning some new techniques along the way too. So mm -hmm. it's very enjoyable. So I work primarily on plexiglass and what doesn't show up in some photographs is when you put light on some of my paintings, then there's, I call them hidden features. You might see other colors or metallics or iridescence or color shift paints might come to light, come to view based on the viewing angle and the light. And this piece, actually, it's painted in reverse. And I paint, I paint most of my plexiglass pieces without viewing the results as I work on it until I'm finished. They all come with some form of protective, either plastic or paper on the viewing side. So I work on it, I'm guessing the whole time as I'm working on it, what, how one color, the next color is going to affect the color in front of it. And if I put a dark behind a dark, uh, the first color will disappear, more or less. Uh, and this one, the final coat on the back of this is a blue color. And so when you hold it up to the light, this painting actually takes on a blue hue. So it will change if you put it in front of a window. And I think when I get it back from the show, if it doesn't sell, I'm going to put some LED lights in it to uh, get it. That option, you know, I did that with one of my paintings, and the the collector really enjoyed it. So uh, I made the frame for this one, and this is one of probably my first large plexiglass piece, and I was trying to come up with a way of exposing the edge because when I saw this on a table, saw the edge gets melted and very rough, and so I take time to sand and polish the edges, and so this one. I put it in the floating frame, but then you'll see on my other piece that's in this show, it's mounted quite differently. So we can find that. It's a triptych. It's my first triptych that I painted. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I just went past it. Yeah, okay. that one there. Cool. And yeah, the, awesome. <laughs> yeah, this, these pieces are probably 10 by 10. Initially, I set them in each inside a frame. I didn't like it. And I thought, how can I mount this to where you can see all the work I put into the edges? Plus, I like the effect you get from viewing the edges. And there's also like an internal reflection along the edges. I don't know what the technical term to that would be. Uh, but I was standing in one of my customer's uh, offices one day, and they had all these awards on the wall that use the sign mounting hardware. And I thought, hey, that'll work for my artworks. And I came up with the idea to mount this on a piece of aluminum that I cut and kind of textured the surface a little bit. But this, uh, all three of these, they had paper on the viewing side. So I had absolutely no idea how it was working. And I think on my Facebook page, there's a, a video of me peeling, maybe not on this particular one, but there's uh, videos of me peeling the paper off to see what the results are. And here again, there's a lot of like micus, uh, or how do you pronounce it? Uh, oxide, iron oxide, there's iridescence and colors that come to light that pop out if you shine light on it and uh, walk around it with some light or look at it with different viewing angles. And actually my background, I have to blame my wife for getting me started creating art. <laughs> so, and I call her the artistic one, but she was taking a, a class here in Wichita 
and at one summer and they were going to cancel class unless they found more participants. So she called me up at work one day and said, guess what? I signed you up for an art class. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not taking an art class. I can't, even draw, can't even draw a straight line. And she says, well, it's abstract art, so you don't have to draw a straight line. And so I was all out of excuses. So I went along with her on that. <laughs> And that was probably 2009, something like that, 2010. And so I've been taking classes at City Arts in Wichita ever since then, almost every semester. I've taken maybe a couple of semesters off, but we like to travel to Santa Fe and, and uh, Taos and go to the art galleries and we take workshops out there. And so that's initially where I learned how to paint on plexiglass was at a workshop in Santa Fe with Sandra Drown Wilson. She's the one that really turned me on to the plexiglass. So I'm just fascinated by the colors that you, and the effects that you get um, by viewing this different angles and with different lights. So anyone have any any questions? Well, thank your wife for letting the genie out of the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Never would have guessed it, you know. You're a wild man. It's good. <laughs> you can't walk into somebody's offices. I can use that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's keeping your eyes wide open that's yeah, awesome yeah. it's great yeah. stuff i love it thank you thank you i appreciate it i have a question curtis do you also paint on the back side of the plexiglass so you you have the front and the back and it informs the the image to the front or is it just painted on the front side of the plexiglass but it's all this is all painted on the black on the back side only oh okay Okay. So as I'm building the layers, and sometimes I lose track of where I'm at. What did I put down last week because I've painted over it? So, you know, pieces um, don't always work out for me. Sometimes I peel the paper off and I'm like, oh, yeah, that did work out very well. And I can't just paint over it and do it and change it because I have to yeah. wash it off with alcohol or something if I really want to change it or scrape it off or whatever. But uh, I see. Uh huh. Fascinating. Yeah, I love the idea of the LED light behind it. That, that could be very cool. I Outstanding. Think. Yeah, that's a great idea. I think. Yeah. I'm going I, to... You are a wild man. This is this is awesome. It's gonna thank you. Put us all I, I'm trying to figure out how to apply this to fabrics because yeah, right. <laughs> well, fabrics have so many different kinds of translucity. So yeah. I I see this somehow. Yeah. yeah. Organza yeah. fabric, a, a very sheer organza would be very cool with this kind of a technique too. Yeah. yeah. Some inspiring. of my, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just saying that's inspiring, uh, definitely for different, different mediums too. Mm -hmm. yeah, and one thing I like about working on plexiglass, the paint is, and sometimes it's so very thin that it's a bit translucent where light will shine through it. And if I mount it on a piece of, of aluminum that I've polished, you get a, you get kind of a double effect because you get the reflection of the metal of all the colors and everything so I'm always experimenting um, I believe this one was painted mostly with a, a torn up bath towel that's one of my favorite things to paint with <laughs> I don't you know and I'll use brayers or whatever I uh, don't normally use paint brushes too much because uh, I don't like for the the brush strokes to show or if a, if a piece of the you know the the hair comes off the brush or whatever the bristle comes off i don't like that being in there but um, a lot of it's done with rags or, or towels or something mm -hmm. if it works use it that's right do you um have to treat the surface first like with rubbing alcohol or something to get the acrylic to really have good adhesion yeah. or Normally is that well. part of the the creativity kind of the unknown of what's gonna really stick well and and what kind of breaks up a little bit or yeah so that, that's i'm glad you asked that because in most cases i can just peel the the protective paper off on one side and usually what i'll do is to make sure there's no adhesive or anything left behind us i'll wash it off with alcohol rubbing alcohol mm -hmm. and what i've discovered if i've drilled through a piece of plexiglass and i use rubbing alcohol on it wherever the the drilling the bore holes are at alcohol will actually attack the acrylic and, and make little fissures, little cracks mm -hmm. around it. And so someone, a sign artist told me to, to use denatured alcohol, won't, that won't happen. But reading the hazmat label on the denatured alcohol, I really don't want it in my house, you know, so. Nasty stuff, yeah. You know, 
I'm just very careful. I use rubbing alcohol. You can sand the surface to get a little bit of tooth. And I have found some paints that if you don't sand, it won't adhere very well and you can peel it off almost like a skin. But yeah, general yeah. purposes, you know, uh, golden brand or any just pretty much most most acrylics will adhere very well. And it, and the longer it's dry, the harder it is for me to remove it. Yeah. I've done, so. Right. Yeah. Well, well, that's a great effect. I like the triptych you. and thank you. how thank it you. transfers down through. Thank you very much. Well, Glad you thank, like it. thank you so much, Curtis, for sharing. That's wonderful. And uh, the uh, last one, uh, Brittany will pull up, uh, Kay, your work. And we have about 10 minutes, I guess. Well, I'll go ahead and start talking. I'm a self-taught artist. And I come from a very artistic family. And um, I did a lot of traveling in my job and took a lot of photos. And this painting here is a finger painting, 100% finger painting. And uh, I took this picture down by Winfield. And um, I've not had, this is about my fourth finger painting that I've done. I use the uh, dual aqua oil paints that I uh, take it right out of the tube and make the painting. I did do a back wash because I wanted, uh, before I started, because I wanted to show that there was more forest behind before I put the trees on the front with the fall foliage. And um, so the, Aqua, the duo aqua oils are wonderful to work with. They're water-based, so it's easy to wash your brushes and get it off of your hands, but it does take as long to dry as an oil painting. But I think anybody that does oil painting with all the solvents and stuff would really enjoy these uh, dual oil paints. Um, I tried to get the fall leaves falling out of the trees onto the kind of a creek in the pond that it goes into. And the leaves that you see on the water are very thick leaves that stand up on the water like you would see them floating. It's a lot of fun to do finger paintings, but I did find out that you better have a pretty simple type theme because with your fingers, you cannot do really teeny tiny details. So I've done a couple paintings of koi fish and I might've had a few colorful words before I got done, but um, anyway, it's a lot of fun to do finger paintings. It's something kind of unusual. Are there any questions? Yeah, I'm just curious how you got such fine detail in the tree, like the tree branches, especially this yellow. Yeah, and the, the, the with, leaves, the veining in the leaves. Yeah. With my little, finger and with my little fingernail. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so that's how I got the leaves. Uh, I would put a thick paint on my finger and then I would kind of move it around and shape it on the water. Mm. And then I take a dark paint and go down the center of it and try to make the veins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was, um, that might've been the cuss word part. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well. But anyway, the trunks, I used my, my little finger and, my, you know, the next size of finger till I could get them on there. Mm -hmm. And it's real easy, just like oil painting. If you do make a mistake, you can go in there with an, uh, the color next to it and just run your finger on and it'll kind of line it up. Mm -hmm. So I'm a very colorful painter, <laughs> as you can tell. Mm -hmm. I've tried to make soft colored paintings but they always end up this this bright i can't help it <laughs> so are there any questions more questions i was just going to say it kind of lends itself to an impressionistic almost pointillist sort of handling of it it's all very consistent you know if you did if you came in with the brush it would look out of place uh, this is this is interesting stuff You're my mother was there yesterday <laughs> and she wanted to feel it because it is, you know, very thick paint. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then I have another painting. 
that um, Brittany will show you that I was in Colorado on a trip with my daughters and I was actually standing on this rock ledge. This is it, this is an acrylic painting. I was actually standing down there on the bottom on that ledge looking out at God's gift because the purples and blues and the sunset was just starting and the light coming across that valley, it was just gorgeous. And I knew the minute I stood there, I had to try to paint it. Well, you can't paint as good as God does, but I had to go home and try. <laughs> The trees took forever because uh, I started like the other lady did back to the back and came forward because I knew I had to have the smaller trees further back and come up to be the large. So it took me a long time to do all those trees. A lot of times those big mountain panoramas can be, it's like you look at the real thing and say, well, I can't do that. So we're basically reduced to interpreting what we see. And yes. You, and you did a hell of a job. That's a that's a really nice painting. I, Thank I, you very much. That, again, you've got that that repetition in the in your in the licks that you that you put in there. That and it reads very consistently and to my eye. It's nice. It's good mm -hmm. stuff. Thank you. Did you use palette knife in the foreground? The rocks are palette knife. All of the rocks are palette knife. Mm -hmm. Uh, the a few of the trees right there in front, I did use a palette knife on them to give them some texture. Mm -hmm. But mainly it is brushwork. And I found these little grass brushes that you there are some really short ones and they make those trees clear to the back. So that was uh, kind of nice to find out. I appreciate the detail as you come forward, like it's how you view things, you know, further back, it loses the detail in the atmospheric and you capture that well. And as it's coming forward, all those trees that you would view from higher up, you see those details. So that's really beautiful to the contrast that you captured in order to really draw the viewer's eye in that perspective. Yeah, you know, I, got, I got a little lost back there in those mountains because you get to painting and then you kind of lose track of your <laughs> where you are, you know, back in there. And so there's probably a lot of layers of paint back there. <laughs> <laughs> Atmospheric perspective, cool colors yeah. speed and warm colors mm -hmm. and dance. Yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. Wonderful. Nicely done. Well, thank you. Beautiful, Kay. If there's any other questions, I think. Um, Brittany just wanted to um, mainly think, well, the, the winners just to announce before, I think you guys have probably seen on the email, but uh, let me see where she said, the Mc, McJillig was the juror and awarded um, best of show to Justin, whose uh, sculpture, Justin Zelke sculptures this one, amazing wood. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second, of course, who, Ron, who's on here with this ever evolving self portrait <laughs> and the third was Terry Miller third third place is Terry Miller whose work is i think Brittany's pulling it up yes okay yeah yeah beautiful piece and also honorable mention to Marciana Vequist sorry if i'm not saying the name right but yes yeah, so always Okay, and uh, she also wanted to just uh, thank everyone for your expertise and also to remind you guys to all come on the opening, um, the reception on April 10th from two to four. And uh, sorry for the audio issues and tech issues, but the uh, museum will post the recording that we did. So those that couldn't come or uh, want to listen again for some techniques. <laughs> and uh, also a big thanks for bringing most fantastic Kansas artist exhibit to Pratt, Kansas. And they appreciate us all. And we appreciate you all. So I hope that's, uh, yeah. oh, also please. Uh, and also a big thank you to Stan for taking phenomenal photos uh, of all the artwork too. So Thank you, Stan. Yeah, Stan, you did a great job. Yeah. So many different mediums and different textures and dimensions. They really look good. Yeah. 
beautiful florist. Laura, you did a great job getting us through this. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yes, you can help out. I have some Very practice good. with the school in the Netherlands. I do Zoom art classes for a school in Amsterdam. So I have a little practice of doing some online. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm glad to connect with all of you. It was really fun hearing everyone's creative process and seeing you in person, well, in Zoom person. <laughs> and connect. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. Yeah, it was really cool. So thank you all so much. Was I yeah, supposed to wear a mask? No, it's <laughs> yeah. Well, I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I hope to see you guys on the tent. So yeah, yeah. I'm planning on being there. Yeah, I'll have my second shot. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Me too. Thank All you. Right. Thank Bye, you. Very Bye. interesting. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.